Hello, this is Dr. Salvatore Vinciguerra, and in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you a little music history, a little bit of music listening. I'm going to be playing uh, two different instruments for you to listen to some musical examples. I'm going to be playing this piano in the background for you. Uh, it'll be one of the first times that um, I'll be playing some musical examples. Uh, on this instrument and a lot of people ask me about the piano in some of my videos and I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about the how I got this piano and so forth. I'm also going to be playing the trumpet later uh, just to show you uh, some musical examples because it does relate to uh, Mazorski and pictures at an exhibition which is the topic of today's lesson and it really is continuing from last week into this week and then near the end of this video I'm actually going to go over some of the assignments for my students because as you know that today I'm not live I'm actually on a video and um, that's because you know last week we were experiencing some difficulties with some of the online learning platforms that we were using. Um, you know that uh, we have been out of school the past three weeks. Uh, one of those weeks was actually spring break and now we're continuing to do some of our lessons online using Canvas for some of our assignments and then I have my students doing smart music assignments and I want to thank again the smart music company for allowing us to use that platform for free until June and this is really a platform that uh, both students and I are experiencing for the first time and um, later in the uh, video today I'm go actually going to be sharing with you how we're using it in our classes and it's a really neat product um, where students are having their sheet music or their method book at home they have their musical instrument out or they're continuing their singing at home. Um, and then this particular um, platform, this musical platform, then listens to them, tells them if they're rhythmically accurate or melodically accurate. And then it actually does all of the hard work for me. It grades them and then it puts it into the computer and then I can continue to make different assignments. And there are other ways of using smart music, which I think will be really interesting and helpful for us maybe in the future going on into maybe next year, as it could save us a lot of time in class just because I could do some assignments there that could count for test grades and it would really alleviate a lot of time that I spent listening to individuals in class and so forth um, for you know just regular assessments that we do every other week and then that way it would give us more time uh, in rehearsal because remember we're taking all of these different uh, ensembles and at our school we have band, we have orchestra, we have chorus and we're taking all of those ensembles that we normally meet with 20 or 30 students uh, in a class and now we're taking that all online so they were rehearsing as a chorus or a band with their various different instruments and now we're doing social distancing and we're all separated from one another and it has created a lot of challenges so we're using the canvas online learning platform to do announcements we're doing assignments in there and then we're also doing some assignments in smart music and I'll discuss some of that at the end we were using zoom and if you notice is that um, in the past week I was doing some live streams. These live streams were, uh, I had two different computers set up at the same time and uh, as I had Zoom there with my students I also had YouTube set up and I was had everybody from around the world. We had people there from the Philippines, Russia, Australia, a wide variety of countries that were just listening to what we were doing and I know that people from around the world sometimes listen to my videos uh, to learn and uh, music education is just something that I think a lot of people are interested in 
and I hope that you learned something from this video today. We were, you know, trying to do that Zoom stuff, and I, a Zoom is it basically like a teleconference type of thing where you get to see people face to face, and I understand the need for that. So a lot of students maybe are disappointed. They did, the students that were in the classroom, I just want to say that to everyone. They did a wonderful job. They were quiet. They listened to me. They listened to me for over 45 minutes, just speak to you the way I am right now. And um, I want to compliment all of them because they really do deserve and you know some award or be commended just for how they were behaving in that class. And I really do appreciate it. Um, but unfortunately, other people during that week were having problems with Zoom. And uh, the last class that I had, we were being hacked by people from the outside. And it wasn't too great of an experience because I felt that our classroom was violated. Um, you may not have been able to see that uh, experience uh, because you're in YouTube and you're somewhere separate, but you may be able to have heard that. Uh, and, you know, for using this type of virtual learning with our students, I've used it for my doctoral degree with Boston University. And, um, you know, most of those particular online learning classes had modules. And we're very fortunate where we're trying to incorporate this live type of experience where the students get to see one another. And it's important psychologically for everyone to get to see one another. And, uh, it, you know, music especially because it is very social. And sometimes when a student, as you heard in one of the videos earlier in the week, there was a problem with an instrument. She wanted to just um, play it for me a little bit. Or, you know, we sang happy birthday to one student in one of our videos. And just some of those different social engagements uh, need to happen. And it's very hard to do it through a video, especially in this time of social distancing. Um, so. Um, I appreciate, um, you know, those students who did what they were supposed to, but unfortunately this week uh, we're going to be learning through a video and make sure that you're looking through all of your different assignments that you have there and there are questions that relate to this video uh, that are part of your assignment for this week in this live classroom or video uh, of me talking to you and, and everybody out there. And I just want to say, even as things were happening on Zoom, um, you know that um, the people on YouTube were behaving themselves. And I never thought that having this set up both ways, I would have thought that maybe there would have been some problems in the chat on YouTube and not necessarily in Zoom. Um, so anyway, um, Zoom really does need some improvements and we're going to be trying to wait for those improvements to happen. And I want our students out there who are listening to this to be very patient because it's just very unfortunate that we cannot continue to engage ourselves even through some sort of um, video conferencing. And uh, it, it is very sad that we can't do that. Um, so, um, you know, it's just one of those things and we're just going to continue with our lessons the best we can. And I think that if you read all of the different assignments, it's very straightforward for you. Um, uh, later in the class, I'll be talking to you more about your smart music assignments. And uh, I want to thank again everyone for being here. And first, I'm going to start off with playing my trumpet. And I want you to listen to me play this particular song. It's called The Great Gate of Kiev. It is one of the movements from Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition.
So that was the last movement of pictures at an exhibition. Uh, the movement again was the Great Gate of Kiev. And some of my trumpet students and people in my advanced band class maybe have said to themselves, oh, that sounds familiar, where does that come from? And actually, it should sound familiar to you because we've actually played it in our method book, Essential Techniques. Um, and, you know, it, I just thought that this particular song, to expand upon it, and also to share with you last week a live recording of the Allstate, or the Florida Allstate Guitar Ensemble performing three or four different movements from pictures at an exhibition, and uh, how unique that was to hear that particular ensemble play uh, you know, different movements from this particular work. And it has a variety of different movements. I'm going to be sharing with you the history of this particular piece of music, and I'm also going to be expanding upon um, maybe what it is supposed to sound like and uh, trying to play some of these examples on this piano back here. And uh, all you pianists out there, give me a break because, um, and first of all, I'm not really that much of a pianist. And number two, um, I just had this piece of music arrive within hours of filming the video because I had been waiting for it uh, for quite some time to come in. So that way I could share with my students on a live stream uh, a little bit more about the history of it so they can see what it's supposed to look like, the printed page, um, because what they're hearing maybe as a more popular type of thing, which or a piece of music, what they usually were to be able to hear when you play a recording on YouTube or something, is not necessarily the way the composer wrote it. And uh, there's some history behind it, which we'll share with you in a moment. So. I'm going to be talking about this particular instrument here and how I got it because a lot of people are always looking for acoustical pianos and they're very expensive sometimes to buy. They can cost anywhere from $2,000 or more. And uh, this particular piano is an upright piano. It's from the 1920s and it's a Vogue mahogany piano. Um, and so I know, I know a lot of people look at this piano in the, as a backdrop or as a prop in some of my videos, but it is an actual working uh, musical instrument and it is quite unique to play. And um, if you were to see different parts of it, it is beautiful because the legs of it are carved at the bottom. And if I were to remove some of the music over here, it actually has some carvings there. And I think that before I got it, somebody did a great job of restoring it. And it still needs some tuning and so forth. Um, I got this instrument for free. And uh, I used to live in Tampa, Florida. And my sister used to live in Palm Harbor, Florida. And, uh, you know, one of the Catholic churches there that she uh, went to, and I did too occasionally, uh, had a bunch of pianos that they were giving away for free, or they were going to throw them away. And uh, people sometimes move, and, you know, they don't want to move the piano because it's so expensive to do so. So I actually paid to have someone uh, move the piano sight unseen, into, you know, across from Palm Harbor to Tampa, Florida, and then I've moved it uh, down here to Miami. And um, it is quite a different musical instrument to play on, uh, but I know that even the pianists out there even say that there's just something about an acoustical piano that some of these electric keyboards just don't do it. And, uh, you know, I just think that that is really uh, something that I also believe in, that I don't think that uh, a real, like the Yamaha that I have in school, it's okay. It's one of the best Yamahas that we have, uh, maybe on the market, because that within itself as an electrical piano is about $2,000. Um, but there's nothing like playing on a real uh, piano because you can hear the hammer hit the strings and you can feel those vibrations and so forth. So that's a little bit about the history of this piano. Now let's learn a little bit more about pictures at an exhibition. Maris Petrovic Mazorski was born March 21st, 1839 and died March 28th in 1881. He was a Russian composer 
and one of the Russian Five. The Russian Five consisted of Mali Balakarov, the leader of the group, Cesar Kuh, Maris Mazorsky, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, you know, the guy who composed Flight of the Bumblebee, and Alexander Borodin. They all lived in St. Petersburg together and collaborated from 1856 to 1870. The Five were also known as the Mighty Handful, the Mighty Five, and the New Russian School, and they were the five most prominent Russian composers in the 19th century. Mussorgsky was an innovator of Russian music in the Romantic period. He strove to achieve a uniquely Russian musical identity, often in deliberate defiance of the established conventions of Western music, meaning he was kind of rebelling against some of the techniques that some of these other composers of the time were doing, and he was trying to be uh, very original in how he was composing his music. Many of his works were inspired by Russian history, Russian folklore, and other national themes. Such works include the opera Boris Gudunov, the orchestral tone poem Night on Bald Mountain, and the piano suite Pictures at an Exhibition. For many years, Mussorgsky's works were mainly known in versions revised or completed by other composers. Many of his most important compositions have posthumously come into their own in their original forms, and some of their original scores are now also available. One of Mussorgsky's closest friends died in August of 1873. It was painter and architect Victor Hartmann. The following year, an exhibition of his works was held. On a visit to the art exhibition, Mussorgsky was moved to compose musical illustrations to some of the drawings and watercolors. The resulting masterpiece was pictures as an exhibition for piano, a cycle of ten pieces with connecting interludes. Mussorgsky composed the entire work in about three weeks. In spite of this musical work's great popularity today, it is very seldom performed in its original version. The work's first editors considered Mussorgsky's harsh harmonies too daring for the time and removed them. Though the editors meant well in their modifications and additions altered Mussorgsky's highly original and astringent musical language. Later editors not only adopted these changes, but even added their own distortions. So what you're about to see here is the piano piece that is most probably representing the most original version of Mussorgsky's work. And that's what you're seeing in these different pictures here. So Mussorgsky wanted his listeners to kind of just imagine themselves being inside of an art gallery, walking aimlessly around from one picture to another picture on the wall and, you know, just trying to interpret uh, musically uh, what these different paintings were. And it starts off with the promenade and this melody comes back over and over and over again inside or in between all of the different movements and he writes it very differently each time and I'm going to play that for you in just a moment but I also want to describe the other movements that he wrote. He, the first movement is the gnome, a dwarf which walks around about awkwardly on crooked little legs. And then he puts the promenade back again. And then you have the second movement, the old castle, a castle in the Middle Ages in front of which stands a troubadour singing. And then he puts the promenade because you're supposed to be walking around and going to the next picture. The Tuileries, subtitled Children Quarreling After Play, and this depicts an avenue in the Tolerary Gardens populated by a crowd of children and nurses. The ox cart, a Polish cart with huge wheels that is drawn by oxen, and then he places the promenade again. The fifth movement is Ballet of the Chickens in Their Shells. This drawing illustrates a scene from the ballet Tribli in which newborn chickens dance as they leave their shells. The sixth movement is Samuel Goldenberg and Schmuel, two Polish Jews, one rich and the other poor. 
The seventh movement is the marketplace in Limoges, French women haggling over goods in the marketplace. The eighth movement is entitled The Catacombs. In this drawing, Hartmann portrayed himself contemplating the interior of the Paris catacombs by the light of a lantern. And he specifically writes this in the tempo of Andante in B minor. And he kind of writes a little inscription right here in this particular part of the work. And when we translate it, it means with the dead in the language of the dead. The ninth movement is entitled The Hut on Fowl's Legs. The drawing shows a clock in the shape of Baba Yaga's hut, which in Russian mythology was said to have been built on chicken's claws so it could turn to meet each newcomer. Baba Yaga was a witch who lured lost souls to her hut and ate them. The final movement is The Great Gate of Kiev. This drawing is an architectural sketch for a magnificent gate to the town of Kiev, done in the massive old Russian style with a cupola shaped like a star helmet. Now this particular movement represents mythological Russian heroes, princes who made Kiev the principal area for their occupation and hunting. So now let's take a careful look at the promenade, the first movement or the first portion of this piece because this is a melody that comes back over and over and over again throughout the piece. And it's not really described as necessarily a movement, but kind of an interlude that goes in between the different parts or sections of the movement. And it's kind of stuck in there in between. So we're first looking at the key signature. The key signature is right after the clef sign and it's in the key of B flat major. We have two flats, so the second to the last flat is B flat, and so that is the name of the key signature, B flat. Notice the time signatures. It goes from 5-4 to 6-4 time. The quarter note is staying the same. So it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 1, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, and five, one, and two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, and five, one, and two, three, four, five, and six. So, you know, it creates a very different um, compositional technique, and it can be very tricky when you're trying to play this. And so when I play this on the piano as an example for you, I'm just focusing on the melodic line and um, I'm not putting those chords in there when I'm presenting this to you. I'm just focusing on the melody so that you can hear it and uh, I think it's a great little example of varying the time signature back and forth and you get to hear that. And then here is a glimpse at the first movement, the gnome. 
and it is a movement again about a dwarf. Notice how he portrays this dwarf and he lowers the actual register of the melodic line to bass clef. And notice he adds all of these different flats if you're looking at this piano score. So you may look at the key signature of the gnome and say to yourself, well, it's just in G flat major just by looking at it. But look a little deeper in here. And some of my students in our advanced classes, we've been learning about minor scales. So look a little bit closer and you'll see some of these naturals here. And basically that's at the raised seventh degree of the E flat minor scale. So um, he's not using G flat major, he's actually in E flat minor in the gnome. And um, it, it, notice also the time signature and he's changed it to three, four time going one and two and three and one and two and three and, and look at, as well as some of the other things that he's doing in the composition where he's going fast and then he has kind of a hold or a fermata. A look at the dynamics. It's loud, soft, loud, soft, and those different types of compositional techniques to kind of portray the gnome for the first movement. And now we're going to be comparing and contrasting the promenade that comes right after the gnome to the promenade that was at the beginning. Look at the key signature of the first one. We said it was in the key of B flat major. And now right here, when we look at this promenade right here, it's in the key signature of A flat major. So he's using the majors for this promenade and maybe cycling through some very related key signatures, especially at the beginning of this composition. He does, in uh, comparison, use the same time signature and technique of moving back and forth between 5-4 and 6-4 time. And, you know, the another difference would be, when you listen to this, notice where he starts the melody. In the first promenade, he was using the treble clef to start with the higher register. And now, in this promenade right here, he has it starting off in the bass clef, giving it a whole different kind of tone to introducing maybe this next movement here. But it does end going and shifting back to the treble clef. take a look at the Old Castle, which is the second movement. And let's pay particular attention to the key signature that he is using here. This is the first time that we see sharps. And on first observation, you may say, hey, let's take that last sharp, which is A sharp, raise it a half step. Hey, we've got B major, but not so quick. Um, this is actually in the key of G sharp minor. And if you look throughout the piece, you're going to see how G sharp is really being emphasized. You see it in the bass and you may see it um, being emphasized in other places, uh, even in the melodic line. So that gives you a better indication that, hey, something is, else is working out here and he is writing this in G sharp minor. Also observe the time signature. We're in 6-8 time, that means there are six beats per measure, and the eighth note is going to get the beat. And now let's listen to a little bit of the old castle. I'm just going to play a few measures, at least maybe up to the first phrase marking or so. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
going to come back to our discussion on pictures at an exhibition in just a few moments. I really wanted to spend some time going over some of the assignments and how smart music works at this time. Hopefully my students have gone to the assignment section so that they can access the questions that go along with this video so that they can get credit for attending or watching this particular video for this week. And um, I just have a few questions in there just to check your learning. And then make sure that you're submitting your document, your e-learning assignment, as a Google document and highlighting all of your answers so that it's easy to read. And if you're out there on YouTube and you're watching, uh, this is a picture of our Canvas learning system. And this is what it looks like for me. You notice that I have files where I have their syllabus, their handbook right there. Uh, assignments are posted there. We had Zoom, we were using it. It's incorporated with Canvas at this time. There's an area to have some discussions. Uh, there's an area for grades. Uh, and then there's the syllabus, which I could put a syllabus there if I wanted to. We just started using this, so I put the syllabus over there on the files for everybody to look at if they wanted to see. And there is a quiz type of uh, product that they have. And then there are different modules that you can build inside of Canvas to uh, help facilitate learning. So you can build a whole course out and then reuse it after the, the year. Uh, conferences, collaborations, Google Drive, and we use a lot of Google products uh, so the students are submitting their work in Google and saving them as Google files and when I make their assignment for this I save it as a Google document and then kind of uh, embed it or put it inside of the assignment section and then they can write directly on it and then submit it to me so it's very easy. And the only other thing that they have that I'm going to show you in just a second that is outside of this that they're doing right now is smart music. Here's a sneak peek inside of what it looks like inside of my smart music portal. And you notice all of the different assignments at the top. And I have band all grouped together, all chorus grouped together and all of the orchestra group together. And I could have separated these different groups uh, depending upon what class that they've taken because there's really six classes, not three. And they're all different because we have the beginning class and then we also have the advanced class. So some confusion with our students is that they're not going to the top of their screen to look at their assignments and marking or selecting the button select all or see all assignments so that they can see all of the assignments. Now what they're viewing here is all of the assignments not only for their class or what is assigned to them for that particular week, but they're also going to see assignments that are also uh, assigned to another class. So they're going to have the advanced assignments and the beginning class assignments in one portal. And that can be a little confusing for our students, but I've kind of told them that they really need to be looking at the directions, and I've given in the live stream some of our students some directions on how to find out which assignments belong to them or the other class. Now this is what it looks like if you were a course student in one of my course classes, and this is a singing exercise and you notice it has some notes going up and then going down and then there are syllables at the bottom so of course students pay attention as you're supposed to select one of these uh, syllables or words and then sing that going up and then sing that going down and uh, play around with these particular exercises over the week. You notice that it's going from different key signature, so starting off in one key signature, going to a different key signature, and really trying to get them to listen and uh, do more of this for some flexibility and intonation um, types of techniques that they're using in chorus class. Um, so it is excellent where the student can actually play it to see what it sounds like. If there are different parts, like let's say it's a band class, and they're supposed to be playing a piece with an entire band. They can listen to the accompaniment part. Um, in the case of chorus, maybe there's two parts or four parts, 
and they're resting. They can see the other part that's supposed to be singing when they're resting. And, um, and then they can turn that on or turn that off. And right here, if you look to the right hand side of the screen, you can see my part and you see the little megaphone and they can turn that off. Right now it's muted and they can make those adjustments. And there is also, if you look to the left hand side, there's the adjustments for the metronome, the adjustments for the microphone, and there may be even a way that they can tune themselves. So I even have to learn all of these different features that they're uh, working on in, in this smart music program. And the idea is here is that students are practicing these different exercises for class over the week. And each week they get a new set of exercises. Now I'm not making it anything, uh, you know, uh, that stringent or anything for them to practice. Uh, we're testing this system and seeing how it can be used for the various classes. Now, um, they have the week to practice and they can do these exercises as many times as they want. And uh, the computer will score them or smart music will score them, their melody, uh, their tempo, their rhythm, and some of the other musical elements. Smart music will also take into account what's going on and then it will give them a grade and uh, so it's easy on the grading side. And remember, especially students, um, you can play these as many times as you want. It will score you and then you can select the best score and submit it to me. So you don't have to necessarily select the first score that you get. Make sure that you're waiting and then practicing it and then whatever is your highest score, then that's the score that you're gonna be selecting it to and sending it to me through Smart Music. This picture shows at the top of the screen where students would see maybe the play button where they could hear what it's supposed to sound like. Um, there's the red button in the middle which means to record. Maybe they can play it back. Maybe there are other features that they get to see that I don't get to see. The metronomes on the right hand side at least for the volume. Um, I can toggle back as a teacher to see what it looks like for different voices. Uh, for example, this is the treble voice and maybe then there's the, ten the tenor voice or the bass voice uh, to see how the parts look. Uh, I can also do that with the band class where I could have a band method and, or a band concert piece and toggle between maybe trumpet and flute or trumpet and see what it looks like for tuba. Um, so there are some very interesting features that we're all playing around with uh, at this time to make uh, the learning experience a little bit more interactive for our students so that they can continue to practice their musical instrument or sing at home. Now for this week, uh, please listen carefully students. Uh, I'm going to be taking some of you out of your traditional method books. So I'm going to be taking you out of the essential elements books at this time for both band and orchestra. And I'm going to be trying out some of these smart music exercises. So when you're looking at your assignments this week, you should be looking for the ones that say smart music exercises and then look for in the direction section you should be looking for which class it is for because the harder assignments are going to be for the advanced class and the easier assignments are going to be for the beginning classes. So this week I'm really focusing on scales. I'm looking uh, to see that maybe everybody has some sort of competency on scale patterns, arpeggio patterns, some classes are actually going to be working on um, their dynamics and uh, different vocal exercises for the chorus students. And percussion, I'm going to be putting you in a special percussion book. And it is the Alfred's Drum Method book number two. And so always look for that. And it's going to look differently in your book too because it's supposed to really help you with your rudiments and really focus on some things that are percussion oriented uh, really with the snare drum because sometimes our drummers get left out and they really need to have their own kind of 
um, you know, method book. And sometimes it's good even to do that with other instruments too, uh, so that they can learn the proper technique for their instrument. But in our band class, sometimes with the Essential Elements book, a lot of our drummers get bored at the beginning of the class. And um, then as we get into more of the songs, they get more complicated. And so I'm hoping to supplement uh, this material just a little bit here to try it out uh, with the Alfred's Drum Method book number two. Don't forget students to play around with all of these different features that I'm showing you and that you're learning about, the accompaniment, my part, the metronome, etc. And um, you know, uh, make sure that when you're submitting something that you're submitting it and you're knowing that you're submitting and pressing that button as I cannot go back and reset and uh, have you take uh, your particular exercise again. So be very careful when you're doing your assignments this week. So now that you've had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Pictures at an Exhibition by Modest Mazorski, um, I hope that maybe you can go a little bit deeper on your own and hear some food for thought. Um, you know, it is controversial in sometimes the musical world because there are purists out there that really want musical works to be performed the way they were supposed to be written. And, um, you know, is it appropriate what Ravel and other arrangers have done with Mazorsky's work? And, um, you know, last week I gave my students um, an article to read on Wikipedia where they could listen to Ravel's work and how it does sound a lot different than this particular piano uh, arrangement. It's the same, but he orchestrated it. And uh, for purists out there, just to think about it, uh, is it okay to do something like that or is it not? Or did Ravel and some of these other arrangers, did they actually help people learn about Mazorsky and pictures at an exhibition. So it has a wonderful history. I think it's an excellent example of program music for our students where uh, he wrote this, each picture represents something and um, in the music and uh, it's just quite a unique Russian composition. And if you le learn a little bit more about uh, Mazorsky as a Russian composer uh, and how instrumental he was in his group of Russian composers at that time. He is very significant and has written a lot of other different things like The Night on Bald Mountain and, uh, you know, those other compositions which, you know, were most probably written for piano and uh, how uh, that comes to life and totally changed. And you've most probably heard A Night on Bald Mountain uh, in Fantasia. So these are some really uh, interesting Russian compositions. So I wanna thank all of my students for being here today. And I wanna thank everyone out in YouTube for being a part of this music history listening type of video that I have for my students on the Zorsky. Uh, I want everyone to take this week Look at the various assignments that I have for you. And, uh, you know, if you have questions, make sure that you contact me about that. And, uh, you know, hopefully next week we'll either come back live or I'll present another video on something different. And uh, it's all made for people or, you know, or my music students to learn something from these videos. And I hope that you did so. Um, if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to this channel, and I want everybody to have a great day. Make sure that you go outside, see the sunlight, walk around, listen to the birds. It's beautiful here in Miami. We have some great weather, and, uh, you know, just enjoy the day. Even though we're doing social distancing and uh, all that type of stuff, please go out and enjoy yourself. Get a breather, breathe some fresh air. Thank you once again, and have a great day. This is Dr. Salvatore Vincigera.